welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. The Grinning Man is a dark and visceral, irreverent British musical with music and lyrics by Tim Phillips and Mark Teitler, a book by Carl Gross and directed by Tom Morris, who also contributed lyrics. Based on Victor Hugo's novel, The Man Who Laughs, the musical first opened at the Bristol Old Vic in 2016, where it was a smash hit. Described by What's On Stage as the best British score in years, the musical was nominated for an Off What's On Stage award for best regional production. In 2017, The Grinning Man transferred to the West End, where it ran for six months at Trafalgar Studios. Captured during its run at the Bristol Old Vic, the musical is now available to stream on demand. Today, I'm delighted to be chatting with the show's composers, Mark Teitler and Tim Phillips. Welcome, Mark and Tim. Thank Thank you very much. So, first question, what made you fall in love with musical theatre? I think... The West Side Story was probably my route in. I think I, I, I saw that as a child and I thought it kind of offered an experience you couldn't get anywhere else. And I think that that was sort of, I, um, I think that became my benchmark. I'm not sure it is quite the same, uh, my, quite my favourite musical anymore, but it was definitely my way into musicals. Yeah, I feel the same about Phantom of the Opera. That was my childhood. Uh, I just enjoyed that you could make fear come alive on stage and, and I guess romance, both of those elements in a kind of really exciting live experience. So, Mark, when you saw West Side Story, was it on uh, the film version or a stage production? Uh, it was a film version. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which actually I don't particularly like much now. I, I love the music. I still love the musical. Um, I'm not crazy about the film. Uh, I, I think that they never really cast the... Uh, I, I, never, I think that they never cast Tony right whenever I see it. Are you looking forward to the new version coming out soon? Is it, that's the Spielberg film, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I am. I'm really excited to see what they do with that. Apparently it's, well, I mean, obviously it's entirely, because it's quite difficult to get the rights to do um, the musical without Jerome Robbins' choreography, which I think is what they've done. Really? They've, done, they've managed to do it without the choreography? That's what I heard. I thought, yeah. If, any, if, if anyone can, Spielberg can, I suppose. I don't, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a bit strange. With that show, it's like doing it without the lyrics or something. He's an intrinsic yeah, part true. of it, is what I mean. So. And Tim, was Phantom of the Opera on stage or yeah, a it was, film it version? Was, yes, on stage twice. I saw it in Vancouver and then I saw it in London. Yeah, I was a, I was a big fan for a while. <laughs> Did either of you grow up or in recent times watch filmed theater or filmed musicals from filmed on the stage? Can't say I watched any film theater at all until I was, um, you know, uh, till I'd moved to London and I was, yeah, 18 plus, I guess. I never really saw the point. I mean, where I grew up, we didn't have any access to theater. It, it was outside of Vancouver in a small town. So I, I guess I saw theater as an, as an only live experience. And I, my experience of film theater would have been, well, I wouldn't have heard of it for one thing, but yeah, it would have seemed like, why, why? <laughs> you know, what's the point mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. I'll be interested to see if that has changed. Yeah. And I think, for the, I think, I think to be perfectly honest, The Grinning Man is the first ever uh, filmed uh, musical I've seen filmed, uh, you know, uh, as a film of the stage show. I, I don't think I ever knew about that as a possibility. Other than, I suppose, for archive purposes, I'd never thought of that as a sort of valid, an entirely sort of unique medium by which to enjoy theatre, which obviously the, the current situation has sort of opened up that door. Yeah, that just to jump in on that, that's true. I mean, it, I don't think it, anyone thought, well, or a very small number of people might have seen it as, as its own uh, form, you know, because there was the stage musical and then there was the film of the stage musical. Yeah, And the film of the stage, I mean, sorry, the film stage musical would have been, yeah, sort of a halfway house of, of, I think it was considered getting the benefits of neither, really. 
neither form correctly at one point until the pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic has definitely shifted. It's been a big change in the industry yeah. as a whole. It's yeah. for me, it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, you must have. I mean, your subscriber base must have must have uh, gone up a lot as well. And so, previous to the pandemic, the the my database on the website had about two hundred shows. And I had another kind of 150 that I was working on to get into the database. And now there's close to 500 that I'm working on wow. behind the scenes that aren't on the website yet. It's just absolutely exploded because A, people are filming new content and B, people are making content that was previously filmed and hidden away in a vault, made it accessible to people, which is like, it, like uh, ours. Super exciting. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other interesting thing is like, for example, I, I watched also, um, Romantic Synonymous uh, uh, on the Bristol Old Vic's website. And again, what, and, well, again, and it's interesting because you, suddenly the staged, the film, I don't even know what you call it, the film stage musical, um, splits off into something that is effectively a recording of a past performance or something you can watch live as well. Um, and I, I found it interesting. I, I, I'm not sure how much I enjoy the actual filmed live performance because there was no audience present for we're living the pandemic. Um, it felt strangely like being at a performance where no one's turned up at. Mm. But, you know, I mean, what's interesting is that when, when there are audiences back in theatres, will it be the case that, we'll, that filming will also be possible with live audiences and you suddenly have an entirely new audience watching simultaneously through a screen? Yeah, well, having an empty room always changes the way the actors, you know, the way the, the performers... Yeah. Uh, respond to each other and just the yeah. way they perform. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have deep feelings about uh, having an audience in uh, an in-person audience when you're filming because it's is it really theater if you're performing to an empty room? It it it's TV. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, lots of lots of distinctions to be made in there. So let's jump over to the Grinning Man. I understand that it was inspired by the silent movie poster. Yeah, in part. I mean. I think, Mark, you found that, you saw that poster on somebody's wall in Berlin, didn't you? So that's... that's right. And then Tim and I at the time were talking, um, we were sort of looking at various different projects and we wanted to find something that was out of copyright. So we, talk, we then talked, we then discovered that that was, that, that was based on a book um, and got very excited after reading the book. I mean, it's not, it's not an easy read as a book. There was a, we saw a lot of problems in it. I think one of the chapters seems to be about 40 pages of uh, hierarchy in the House of Lords. Not much fun. <laughs> but I think buried in it, <laughs> we thought there was a, there were some really interesting archetypes. Um, and, the, uh, and, and Carl Gross, who's the book writer, um, also is very humorous. So he was able to sort of bring another layer of uh, humor to the piece that is there, but in a much more muted form. What what is it that drew you to the themes in the book? And it's kind of uh, people have described it as like a dark fairy tale. Is is that what drew you to it? I I think the freak element, the freak show element of it, absolutely drew us into it. I mean, one of the it was just an area we were interested in from a previous collaboration based on the Master of Margarita as well. I think Mark and I felt that we had a language for tackling, you know, the sort of macabre elements of it. Um, yeah. And I, we, you know, we knew we wanted a love story. We thought that was important for the musical that we wanted to do. Um, and just because so many, it's such an important element of so many musicals, I think certainly in the back of my mind, and also all three of us, when we had our first meeting, Carl and Mark and I discussed Phantom and how we were all at various points, big fans of that show. And, yeah, and I think there, there's a sort of gothic romance of that was was partly what we were going for. It became a very different thing. I mean, it started off, I think, much more in Les Mis in our head, as a kind of a Les Mis thing in our heads. I think we just, you know, I, I suppose it was crystallizing as, as we went along. But what Carl certainly brought to it was the element of um, making it a, a much more of a fairy tale and also modernizing the material a lot, getting really cutting out the sort of boring historical um, uh, tom tominess of it. 
And then uh, the fairy tale aspect also comes just from the way that Mark and I collaborate together. It's <laughs> it's a fairy tale. No, I mean um, the musical, <laughs> uh, the kind of theme, the way we develop our themes start tends to have been um, starting with a very simple nursery rhyme type of theme and really like stretching that in different directions and seeing how much yeah. mileage we could get out of it. Um, and yeah, we took that approach into this. So it all sort of coalesced into a, into a gothic romantic fairy tale. I think also there was a, um, an attraction to character as well. You know, I think yeah. um, you, you tend to sort of, I sort of think in this, in the case of the, the, the man who laughs, I, I felt that grin pain was just, we both sort of understood that there was natural music in that world. There were, the, the, the themes are very heightened. Um, the dilemmas are very sharp. Um, the idea of someone who's revolted by his own appearance seems to have been something that we, we, we came across in a couple of the ideas that we'd had. Um, so there were, there were themes that we were interested in looking at that also seemed to uh, all come to life in that story. How much of it was developed uh, through workshops and how much were you just writing sort of on your own or together and then working with actors? Uh, in, the, in the first instance, Mark and I got together for a period of, I can't remember, maybe, maybe three weeks, three or four weeks, uh, and just free wrote after reading the book. So we came up with themes and thematic material, most of which ended up being the principal themes of the show. Um, but in different places to where they were originally intended. So um, a lot of stuff was sort of written in abstract, essentially. And then we pinned it onto characters or scenarios after after the fact. Uh, and then uh, actors didn't really come into it for quite a while. We, we then went into a series of workshops with uh, Carl and Tom. Um, I, I'd say we did at least two of those, didn't we, Mark, before we had a reading? I think it was, yeah. We did a couple. We did one which was just very simple, kind of working out what the basic treatment and outline of the piece was narratively, what we were going to change, what we were going to scrap, etc. And then another one which was a bit more um, at the piano, working out how songs worked. Um, and then I think mm. there was a, th a further workshop where we introduced actors. I think we did a reading at the end of the second one, maybe. Something yeah, like that's, that. That but yeah it was, we sort of, we put together a lot of stuff first and then you know, had and then heard it, but read by a group, which included Julian Bleach, actually. He was at the very first table read and never left. So glorious. And the, the capture shows him so beautifully. Mm. Something I'm obsessed with with the score is how high it is. <laughs> and it just, it just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And I feel like the Act One finale is like this transcendent, like, you, we break the rafters now. <laughs> yeah. Well, we wanted to give him a superpower. So the idea was that he's so kind of hobbled um, that we, we, we agreed that quite early on. We wanted him to have a sort of a super voice. So, uh, and partially because um, when we're working together, I tend to test the songs and I have a pretty high range. So um, it just felt, I don't know, it just felt like the right thing to do, didn't it, Mark? Absolutely. And the other the thing that I think I'm not sure does come across, so correct me if I'm wrong in the recorded version, is just how loud he is without a microphone. That's another that's sort of another Julian Bleach superpower. Um Oh no, we're talking all... about Louis. Oh sorry, you're talking about I think I she, I think she means she means the Grim Pain uh... the, the, the 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 labyrinth theme. No, the uh the singing, the the uh, vocal pyrotechnics that vocal Louis does. Yeah. The, yes, yeah, yeah. Specifically the range of the part. Yeah, I mean he's 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 absolutely crazy. He can he seems to be verging on being a bass and a counter tenor. But but Julian Bleach does sort of also fit that description in his own way as well. He 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 managed to surprise everyone quite a few times with uh how improbably high he could sing. He's got yeah. And what you're speaking about also about uh Julian Bleach's uh loudness, his energy just leaps off the screen. Mm. It's uh like that very opening bit where he's walking onto the stage and addressing the audience. You know, having never seen the show live, I'm only I've only seen the capture. To me, it's so I it's so deliciously theatrical. Like it's it I can feel like I'm in the room with him and I know what it would feel like mm -hmm. to have him talk to me. And I'd be mm. a little bit scared, to be honest. <laughs> Did you see it live at, ever? No. Right. No, I was I was in the U US already when mm. it when it had opened. Yeah, he's he it, has that. I mean, he's an extraordinary actor. He can be very frightening and fun at the same time and 
sort of comedic and and tragic. And he's really, yeah, he's a he's a live wire. And obviously, bringing in. Um... Tom Morris, you were going to have puppetry as a part of the show from early on. But what at what point did you realize that puppetry was going to be an essential part of this show? That was one of the things we were looking for when we um so we want we knew Tom was going to direct the musical before we knew what the musical was. Um we due to a couple of aborted previous attempts to do a musical, but the team was already sort of assembled. Um, so we knew Carl was going to write it. We, we knew that Mark and I would collaborate on the score. We knew Tom would direct it. We just didn't know what it was. So when we found um, The Man Who Laughs, it had the character of Mojo, and it had the uh, the obvious difficulties with his disfigured face. I mean, it's probably one of the reasons why it hadn't been made into a musical before, is <laughs> a lot of people were looking at us going, well, how are you going to, how is he going to sing if he has no face? Um, which you know we saw, and that did keep us up. That that it did it did keep us up at night for a while. Um, yeah, I well, it was it was. Can, can he even sing? Does he not? Sing? Maybe he doesn't sing. Maybe he's a puppet. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the puppetry was definitely something we saw uh, being uh, uh, the wolf. So yeah, so yeah. It was um, there were a few things that needed to be in the story in order for us to sort of green light whatever the, sh the musical we were going to create would be, and and this book had it all. So you you've you've written the show, uh, you had several workshops, and then it opens at the Bristol Old Vic, and at some point during that run, the show is filmed. Yes, I think I believe that. I'm, we're not really sure when that was taken because um, it was a live capture they did. Uh, for archive purposes. So it was probably later on in the run, um, come to think of it. I think the London one was done during a preview, but yeah, this capture was uh, later on in the run. So it was it was done shot in high def. Uh, the intention was just for us to be able to look back on it and remember what we did and hopefully uh, remember that some of it was quite good. Um, yeah, and then... Uh, after the pandemic hit, uh, Tom said Bristol would like to release a number of shows from their catalog. What about The Grinning Man? Because it was such a hit there. We said, absolutely no way. All we have is an archive video and no. <laughs> so they said, well, how about we give it to the people who filmed it? Because they seem to think that they have enough in the in the tank, as it were, to be able to zoom in, to be able to... Uh, you know, make it less than just a somebody with their iPhone at the back of the stalls sort of thing. They they recorded uh, it on four cameras. Yes. Yeah, they recorded and it on four cameras. So they were able to convince us that the sound was also quite well recorded and everything had been done really well. So something we we weren't aware of. So uh, yeah, they took it away for a, a week or two or something like that and came back and yeah, we were all really floored by how how well it came across actually. And yeah, what we had was was much better than what we uh what we knew we had. So, okay. So first of all, shout out to um, Bristol Old Vic and TV Production Partnership, mm -hmm. who filmed it, for deciding to film an archival copy in high definition with four cameras. I mean, most people who film their shows will just stick a, a you know an iPhone at the back of the theater and or get it from the sound booth. So, like the foresight to to have a beautiful capture like that, even if it wasn't edited, you know, five years ago. Yeah, uh, that's you know a, a message to creators out there. Even archival copy can be decent quality. Yeah, yes, that's true. Can you tell me more about your resistance? Like, why why did you initially say no way? Don't don't put it out there. Well, because uh, I think there's a tendency in theater sometimes to 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 put things out that because you have them and not because I mean Mark and I are very we want to be very protective of the work. You know, we want it uh, to be the best possible quality. So if there is going to be a a release of any type, then it should be thought through in advance primarily. So not an archive that's released, but something that is planned and filmed for release. 
and and, um, and it comes to define it. I mean, if you have one performance and that particular performance isn't a, isn't a great one, um, lo- lots of people feel that they've seen the show, and it's not the show that you think they should have seen. Um, yeah, that's the first thing. Secondly, we, we weren't convinced necessarily about sound. Sound is obviously to us, sound is very important. Um, and I think I personally, I'm not sure if you shared this prejudice, but I think at the time, and I've obviously changed since then. Um, I was slightly of the view that you're kidding yourself if you um, imagine that you really experienced a theatre show without being part of the audience live. I mean, I sort of think, what's the point of theatre if if um, there isn't that sort of sense of being in the room and that being a one-off thing? And that's what makes it in- interesting because um, I was a bit more hardline about that. I feel I feel like I've softened a little bit um, over the past year. Yeah. Well, and there's also another key consideration was that that production of The Grinning Man changed significantly when it moved to the West End. So, mm. uh, and we're about to publish globally the West End version of the show with um, Concord Theatricals and Samuel French. So uh, we were thinking, I guess our, our thinking was, do we want to release a more of a beta version of the show. So, I mean, it was, it was solved pretty easily through a discussion. And we, we just said, well, we'll clearly label it as the original Bristol production. And then people will know it's not the same one. So that was fine. Actually. Mm-hmm. We just had some reservations about whether the quality, a, whether the quality would be good and b whether the version was, you know, whether it was okay to release that version in hindsight, I'm really thrilled that it's out because I think, I think it plays really well. And, um, you know, anything, I mean, it's still 95% the same show. So, um, yeah, I think uh, anything that gets it out there and makes it look good can only be a good thing for the continual, the continuing life of The Grinning Man. Well, and there are a couple of moments I really love, love in it, which, uh, are no longer, which weren't in the West End version. Yeah. Uh, we, we wanted to make it tighter, more concise, and I think we did the right thing. But there are moments where I think... Um, I personally loved Julian Bleach's puppet show. Um, that, yeah. isn't, that, is, that didn't make the West End cut. I love his line at the end of it. It's not as easy as it looks or something to that effect. <laughs> yeah. Puppetry, it's not as easy so as it looks. So good. Yeah. <laughs> were, you given, uh, like, were you given a copy of the final cut before it went out and given a sort of a, a veto? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have to use it, thankfully. <laughs> no, we were, I think, just to reiterate, we were very impressed with it when we saw it. So it was a nice surprise. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I was, have to, I have to say, very, very surprised by how well they'd edited it. Because Tom also slightly undersold. He said, we will go away. It's not, it's, it, it might not be full bells and whistles, but actually what I saw seemed to me, uh, compared to what I was expecting, full bells and whistles. Yeah. When I read that it was an archive recording, I was like, this cannot be an archive recording. It's, yeah. It has bits of the audience and it's got different angles and there are close-ups and the sound is really good. Like, it is not your average archival recording. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know what you would add. Like, maybe a drone or something in, in, in one of the theater. And <laughs> wouldn't work for safety purposes, but... A, a camera on a on a Grimpane puppet or something. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. perspective. <laughs> well, I think, I think in a... You might you might have another archive recording or another, a couple of other shows to do a to cut into for a, if there's an error or something. That's the, probably the mm, only way it could true. potentially be improved. But yeah, I'm not complaining. Mm. So it was released. The film you allowed it to be released to the world, and it uh, Bristol Old Vic streamed it through their new site, Bristol Old Vic at Home, in July 2020. And the stream was viewed in 52 countries and had tens of thousands of views. Um, And then it was released again in November, and it's now available until the end of April. What has been the response for you as composers? We haven't really heard yet because they're they're waiting to tell us (laughs) how many people have (laughs) downloaded it and all of that. But, yeah, there were 125,000 uh, views of the free stream when we put that out in June, which is what, yeah, we did it in stages. I guess we agreed that we would do the free stream for a week. Um, and I think Bristol were saying we'd like to do that as a test to prove to you that there's enough interest to do the the uh, paywall stream. And they did. So 
I mean, the other yeah. thing that's great, I, yeah, so this is perhaps not answering properly your question because my, my answer would be the same as Tim's. Um, but I suppose another thing that's been great about having this out is that it keeps the show alive um, in a way that we weren't expecting. You know, there, there has been, it does seem to me that there's been a lot of excitement around it. Lots of people watched, ha- have watched it. Mm. Um, and, you know, and the hope is, especially as we're launching, as Tim said, um, Concord Theatricals have taken on the world where I write. You, 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 there's, it, it, I imagine it can only help with getting the word out and reminding people of the show. Yeah, and the few, it's, it, I'll just touch on it. It is in development in several other forms uh, in terms of having a future life. So, um, yeah, we're just trying to keep the fire burning. And this is, uh, this is all part of that. What is it like to revisit it uh, sort of four or five years later after that initial run uh, and to see it again in this way? I, I mean, it's sort of a strange mix of nostalgia, um, thrill. It's it's always nice to see something you did a fairly long time ago now and realize that you did quite a good job. Um, and, you know, it shoots you right back into the room because I, I, it's like you're there again as soon as you're watching it. I remember sitting in the, anonymously sitting in the audience many nights watching the show. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange feeling. <laughs> we all knew sure. you were there, Tim. We all yeah. saw you. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, did did you have a thought about that? I think for me, is the, the primary feeling was uh, one of nostalgia. I also think that I was, as I sort of mentioned earlier, I'd forgotten some of the bits that I loved that we cut. And it doesn't mean to say that I think we made the wrong decisions in cutting things, because, you know, I think to make a good show, you have to cut bits that you love. I mean, that's just... Um, called Focus. Um, but I think I really enjoyed that because when, when, when I saw the video, I got so used to the West End version that suddenly to be reminded of those other things that we cut that I loved on their own um, mm. brought, brought me a lot of happiness. It's also very useful in terms of the future life. You know, we might be able to sneak at the odd uh, three-minute scene back in um, if we're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> a musical is never finished it is only rewritten exactly <laughs> yeah and I think when I was thinking of that phrase I think it's Shonda Rhimes says it of you have to kill your darlings yeah yeah that's true to, to let the show be what it has to be that's um but it is I think it's so great to be able to revisit those those moments from previous runs and and see how the show has evolved too Yes, I'm yeah. really curious. Um, the show has been billed uh, by Bristol at Home as a rare bootleg capture of the original Bristol version. And I'm curious why, I, maybe you don't know, uh, why they chose to use the word bootleg when it was, you know, it is a, a legitimate capture and it's, it's not an iPhone in the back of the theater. Well, I think that was just to, that was their way of clarifying that it, it was n- uh, originally not intended as a production broadcast so just to sort of make it feel a bit um yeah just to try and get across the idea that it was not intended for broadcast but we're broadcasting it because it's it turns out it's quite good that's yeah i think they were just very wary of overselling it yeah or saying it's the de- it's the definitive it. <laughs> right maybe maybe i think that's better than saying it's the defining definitive version of the show yeah. because that was the uh you know the conversation we were all having at the time about how to how to announce it. So something that I am very curious about, and I, I hope that more happens with it. In I think it was 2018, um, Andy Circus with Imaginarium did a motion capture of the show. Can you tell us more about that? I think Andy came to see um, the second to last show. It was certainly one of the last shows. Fell in love with it, and uh, what because he runs Imaginarium Studios, which is, um, at the time, I think they had a partnership with, uh, Tim, I'm forgetting the details. Magic, now. What was the Magic Leap, an Magic Leap, Aug- augmented right. reality company in Florida. Yeah, yeah, so they were developing a technology, which is entirely new, um, for capturing live performances um, and turning them into, essentially, filmed versions of the stage show, but with a twist, which is that they would be um, projected into your own living room as three-dimensional figures 
possibly even with I with in so so in, in a way quite advanced to the point where you could even walk around and eye contact would would you'd still maintain eye contact with performers. Um, so they wanted the Grinning Man to be the product that um, they used to showcase the technology, which was great because I think I, I I think there's potential for it to have life beyond that, but um, it meant that they were able to invest in cap- motion capturing the whole show. Um, I know that some of the performers found it strange because um, there's, it's a completely dead acoustic. And so you're performing to no one without any uh, ambience at all in the room, uh, sonically. Yeah, wearing a skin-tight green suit. Yeah. Or, or a skin-tight <laughs> gray suit on a green screen, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so it... Um, yeah, it's an experiment that's still developing is is the is the long the short way of describing that long process. Um but essentially Andy yeah spent I think about a week motion capturing the entire show scene by scene with everyone radio mic'd and singing uh and Tom Deary and our musical supervisor uh accompanying everyone with the idea that it can be retrofitted with an orchestra and uh, backgrounds can be drawn in or uh or characters can become life size or greater than life size um digital um apparitions in the real world if you're wearing the right eyewear so you can um in the same way that something will appear on your phone's camera if you're i don't know if you've used augmented reality before but uh, essentially, you at the moment you look through a camera, and they will add, say, a, a, a Porsche or some sort of item to the real world that you're seeing. Uh, what's coming is that you'll put glasses on, and and those um, digital objects will be overlaid into the real world. So obviously, this could be very exciting for theater because, um, apart from uh, the obvious bringing a, a, a tabletop theater into your living room, for example you can bring the uh, audience member into the show too, or have the show surround mm. the audience member or, uh, or do, do it in unconventional places or, you know, on the beach or wherever. Um, so that's, that's the road we're going down with that. And it's, um, it's very exciting. Yeah. And I think, as I think Tim implied that the, the difference uh, between augmented and virtual reality is that we're still able to see everything else. It's sort of, as I think you said, overlaid. So it's, yeah. you're, still able to, you're still present in reality. It's not like when you put the glasses on, you're only seeing a film. What makes it so interesting, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, you're seeing reality plus whatever the content creator chooses to add to reality. Yeah. Yeah. Funnily enough, the difficulty with it at the moment is, is sound because a lot of the tech they're doing is visual tech. And there's a whole complicated issue of, you know, not just involving the direction of the sound, but um, the quality of the sound and how at the moment the sound comes through little speakers on the side of the glasses. And that's, you know, long term not going to be good enough. But so there's a there's a long developmental road ahead with that. But what we've got in the tank uh, and we're still discussing this could be realized in a number of different ways. Everything from a sort of a traditional animated type of film, uh, because they can they can draw over top of the the stuff they've got captured um, to everything in between, you know, to, to a full on augmented reality theatrical performance or yeah, there's a lot we can do with it. And that's what we're, we're discussing about uh, how to take it forward at the moment. So. The sound is something interesting. Um, a little while ago, I chatted with a, um, an, an American actor and dancer uh, who is also a um, engineer. And we talked about virtual virtual and augmented reality and the possibilities of how that could be integrated into theater and how what technology is available now but we didn't talk about how how people are hearing sound and i think that's really interesting like i have visions that one day you know someone sitting in sydney could like tap into a show in the west end and like put on their goggles and they it's like they're sitting there and they can turn their head and see the theater and like experience the show but what they're hearing there's, there's binaural sound as well. I mean, so, you know, in a way, you know, the technology does actually exist. Um, but it hasn't, but we didn't, wasn't necessarily something that people put at the forefront when they're sort of experimenting with these kinds of technologies. As Tim said, the focus is on visual side. 
Um, mm. It would be fun to try and bring them together and, and, and to do a show that was AR, but, but with binaural sound, because sound makes such a difference to how you perceive things visually as well. Yeah, and we don't necessarily realize that to the extent that we think we do. But um, yeah, obviously there's a huge technological hurdle in terms of what people have available at home. Um, so I think it'll be a long time before, you know, like we all carry around an iPhone now, but that took a number of years to become the norm. I think with augmented reality, you'll see the same sort of adoption curve. It'll, it'll take a while to, at some point the dam will break, but I think we're a few years away from that. Um, and until then, it might be uh, more specialized events. So we might go to a, an augmented theatrical performance, uh, be given glasses and uh, maybe a pair of headphones to, to walk around a room and experience it in that way. So it'll, I think it'll be more event driven to begin with. What's interesting about this, though, is that, you know, in terms of the um, film stage musical, is it's it, it, the, the the boundaries between that and a dedicated film adaptation are sort of being blurred and broken down through the invention and development of AR. Yeah, it's potentially very very exciting, especially in terms of um, the the kind of reach that shows will be able to get. You know, it, it won't just be the audiences who can get on the train and go into central London who can experience the best shows. I mean, theoretically, people all over the world could be able. To would be able to tune in. So, you know, the West End becomes like a, a broadcasting station to, the, to planet Earth, and so does Broadway, rather than just uh, a geographical location. Of course, the flip side of that is live tickets would become <laughs> very much more expensive, I, I'd imagine, in that world than they are now. Yes, I'm, I'm very curious what the long-term uh, impact is going to be. And on that thought... You, you have both worked in sort of film and TV mediums. Do you think that the idea of filming shows, if it becomes more the norm, will that change the way that you write for theatre with the idea that one day it could be filmed and distributed? Yes. In what way? Uh, I think already soundtracks for theatre have become much more filmic. I mean, you look now as opposed to uh 15 20 years ago there they sound there are a lot more scores that sound like like films rather than uh you know a, a small band of musicians in a pit sort of thing uh and i think i think to some extent i don't think the forms are merging but i think there's an acknowledgement of the other form and the potential for especially musical theater to to uh genre hop so there's absolutely an awareness whenever you write a musical that it could one day be a film or... Yeah, I think a lot of contemporary musical theatre already has quite a lot of influence from film soundtracks. Yeah. Does, aside from it being adapted into like a movie musical, which is its own thing, do you think just uh, just filming a stage show, like The Grinning Man, if, if that had been intentionally filmed rather than for archival purposes... And distribute it like like what the National Theatre does. Um, if you know that you know you're going to write a play or write a musical mm -hmm. that's going to be broadcast in cinemas, will that change the way that you write for theatre? Uh, less so. I, I I think much less so. I think it, I think it would change the way that you approach the capture because you'd want to make sure that the, for example, the the pit players are going straight down into the tape machine sort of thing. Uh, or the, the digital recorder, rather than being content with a microphone out in front of them, you know. So you, it, it affects how you mix the sound production essentially. Um, so yeah, but I don't think it affects how you write. No, I think Tim's right. I mean, I also think on some level, part of me thinks not only it, would it not, but I don't think that it should influence how you write. I feel like your primary duty is um, to make a great live experience. And then worry about uh, creative ways of bringing that to life as a secondary concern rather than one that's sort of influencing the, the, the creative suit that goes into making a, a live show. Completely. Yeah. I just mean there's always a knowledge that it could transfer. And I, th I do think on some level that, yeah. might, that might affect the way that you, you know, you just, if you know the part's being written for a man, it affects how you write the part. So, same sure, thing, that's true. You know. Do you think that? 
allowing films, uh, and I mean filming the live stage show rather than a movie musical adaption, do you think that will be an intentional part of your future work? I think it'll definitely be something that is is a much more important component along the journey than it used to be. So yes, I think I think probably early on we'll all be having discussions about when we do the capture, because there's now that knowledge that the capture might be the way that people, the way most people experience the show, and and that is a new, have, that's definitely a new thing, you know. Yeah, and I have friends in different countries who are sort of I, I talked to about the Grinning Man and who were never able to come and see it, and I mean they were delighted to be able to watch it, and you know I think my previous conservatism was that if was as I mentioned earlier that you know if you if you've watched the stage if you've watched the film of the stage show does that does that stop you does that make you feel that you've you've now seen it and you don't need to bother going and seeing it live um, I mean there's a commercial question as well as a creative consideration there I'm not sure that's true I mean my my sense from talking to friends was that actually it whetted their appetite even more and 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 gave access to people that might not otherwise have access to yeah and uh, and of course. Hand in hand with that is we need to be ecstatic about what's being released. So I think absolutely you're going to see a lot more interest in, in the quality of, of these types of recordings and, and the way they're approached and just how good they become. I mean, already they've become much, much better than they used to be. I mean, I've watched archival theater recordings that, could, you know, put Rip, Rip Van Winkle back to sleep. Like they're, they're you know... Yeah, and I've I've done a number of them of, of stuff I've worked on that are just snoresville, you know. And and actually, for a very long time, the consensus was that theater doesn't work as a recorded medium, just doesn't work. Uh, and I think that's completely changed. I mean, in a, it's kind of a quiet revolution that's been going on in the past year. So, feels like you're in the right place at the right time with your project, too, Louisa. I hope so. I mean, the thing that's fascinating to me my history brain is like, we've been filming theater since we invented cameras and there has been a market for them since that time. Like the first Vitaphone shorts were vaudeville mm. numbers and they may have been filmed in a soundstage, but they were stage pieces, you know, brought into a soundstage and captured on camera. And I mean, the irony there is that vaudeville stars were scared that talkies were going to steal their livelihood, which it ultimately did. But <laughs> <laughs> historically, it uh, we have those people on record now. And if we if we hadn't filmed them for for Vitaphone or, you know, those shorts, um, we wouldn't have a record of those people. And there is uh, and what has been filmed over time and the way it has been filmed has absolutely improved. And, and the last year has been a watershed for that. But, uh, you know, the first broadcast of a West End show was like 1939. Like, really? We've, That's we've been amazing. doing it. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. And then the war got in the way. Um, I, mean, I suppose, <laughs> and I there, suppose there's a market for it. Some, some people have, um, feel that the beauty of theatre is precisely the fact that it's, a firm, uh, that it's one off. That, you know, you know that you're experiencing something that no one else will experience again. And that. That is sort of an inherent part of the excitement. It'll be interesting to see, to see how, yeah, if it goes back to the sort of exclusive live experience thing. I think, I think with the relaxing of restrictions and if as things go back to normal, touch wood, um, you might find a reversion to the old ways takes place. That people are much more reluctant to have things because the the perennial worry is that they'll drain. Uh, box office from the actual show and then the i mean that's that is a real worry because then shows become financially unviable you know they uh a lot of this uh release of footage has been out of necessity i mean theaters are drowning so any anywhere they can scrape up uh some income is has been a lifeline so with in the new world it, it's actually more like a cut rate ticket um, or it functions more like that. So I, I don't know. It's, you'd have, probably have to ask someone who knows more about um, theater administration than I do. But it'll be interesting to see if, if it uh, sticks around as a really important component of, of, I suppose, marketing or, yeah, broadcast or whatever you want to call it, of, of live theater. Or whether people get accustomed to sort of a certain... I mean, you know, I can't help but think that if people get accustomed to a certain quality of recording 
and capture, uh, it might provide an extra layer of income rather than being something that detracts from theatrical income. In the ideal world, I think that's what, what would happen, yeah. So this has been super fascinating. It's, um, it's very interesting to talk with like the creators of the work and that you weren't necessarily deeply involved with the capture of it, which is how a lot of people are going to experience this show for the first time. Yeah. And, and your perceptions on what, what it is to film your work too. I think it's interesting to feel that resistance and the, um, the challenges and, and what, what you see as um, the restrictions, like is, is your livelihood going to be affected in the future by by capturing theater, which I don't think it is. I, I think there's plenty of evidence to the contrary, but I can, it's, it's really interesting to hear your concerns about it and, and why they exist. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I suspect it won't be affected. And I, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, it will be enhanced and more people will be able to enjoy the work. You know, I think, Mark, we always saw The Grinning Man. It's not, I mean, we were making it as a theater show, but I think we approached it, it feels like a world, not a, not a, a medium that's true, and specific. I think that, that yeah, it's true, and I think that there's a question here as well, which is some shows might fare better than others, depending on their sensibility, yeah. and I think, as Tim says, i mean there's there's a I think we're both quite cinematic in the way in which we write anyway. I think there's something very cinematic about the world of the grinning grinning man, so it might be that some shows um work better in that medium than others, yeah, I think that's true, very interesting. I, have to, I need to ponder that some more. So I have some wrap-up questions that I ask all my guests. Uh, to start with, what is your favorite musical? West Side Story. Back to the origin story. I'm gonna go Cabaret. I like that. I'm guessing because you both haven't watched, I've, this has maybe changed over the past year, but do you have a favorite filmed live musical? The Grinning Man. Thing. Yeah, I've only ever seen The Grinning Man, so, yeah. I, so technically it is The Grinning Man. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfect answer. <laughs> we very briefly touched on this earlier. Uh, a filmed live musical is not exactly a film and it's not exactly theatre. So what should we call it? A flimsical. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. I, I love it. <laughs> That's actually quite brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer I've ever had to this question. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Wordplay. <laughs> <laughs> That's super funny. A fl- Did you say filmsical or flimsical? No, a flimsical, yeah. A flimsical. <laughs> I think it's perfect because it it kind of encompasses what a lot of the industry feels about what this is. We're not sure if it quite works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's flimsy. It's it's throw it away. Yeah. It's it's uh <laughs> That is brilliant. Where do you both stand on bootlegs? Uh, I think I'm against I uh, yeah, I'm against bootlegs because they I mean, it's, you know, for the same reason that other content creators and copyright owners are, they, they make it impossible for us to continue to make a living. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the bootleg is premised on the idea that um, everything should be free and it doesn't take, it devalues the amount of time that you spend and the amount, the amount of risk you take in spending that time working on something and trying to make something brilliant for people. Yeah. And also there's, I, I don't think people realize that nothing's, I mean, I think, a lot of people do realize, but you know, even a even a Google search is not free. They they require access to your personal information, for example, you know, um, which they then sell to advertisers. So, yeah. So I, I'm I'm fairly anti bootleg. I would have to say. What do you wish had been filmed? Mm. I never saw the Pillow Man. I always wanted to see that. I wish mm. I'd seen. I, I don't think there is a film of that. I looked into it. Um, That's, I was just thinking the same thing. It, it would be really cool to have a, an archive of every show you've ever enjoyed, wouldn't it? Of the actual, yeah. the night you were there sort of thing. Yes. Oh, yes, please. Dreams and wishes. Box set DVDs with, like, I have visions of, uh, like, my, you know, big shows. Like, I'm, Hello, Dolly comes to mind. Like, and I want, a, I want every single woman who's played 
Dolly. I want a box set <laughs> with like every every version. <laughs> wow. You'd be watching like, that wouldn't it be cool weeks. to have a box set of the Grinning Man, the Bristol Old Vic, and the, yeah. the West End? Yeah. That's that's on my wish list. <laughs> <laughs> just just saying for future. <laughs> <laughs> If if an audience of one can get her wish, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you and en- you enjoyed the show so much. Having just seen it live, it's really interesting that somebody who's only experienced it that way can become a, a fan of the of the show that that way. So that's cool. Oh, it was uh, so exciting! You, is there anything that you would have done differently yeah. in the filming of it? Just curious because you 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 you're obviously very experienced. You've watched a lot of flimsicals. Um, <laughs> is there anything you would have done differently? <laughs> I don't think so. It's it, for added. me. It um, it has all the elements that I love in a good capture. You mm. you get a sense of the space. You can see that there are shots of the audience. Um, it's very the storytelling with the camera is very clear. It's I'm never confused about who is singing or or where the action is. Um, and it's what I love about it is that it's not too fast. It's not frenetic. There's not like a million cuts for the sake of being filmic it's like it stays in one place and then it it moves as it needs to rather than being like we're jumping all over the place because we have a thousand angles Mm. Uh, that makes me crazy when I'm watching a film live show and also that it's pulled back Um, so many times it's too close Mm. and you don't get a sense of the whole stage and um, you really do in The Grinning Man and you get the feel of it as an ensemble show it's it's not about one or two characters. It's like about these, what is it, 15 people mm. um, and the musicians too. Like you just get a sense of all of it. And that's that's what I love about the capture. One of the interesting, and due to the West End regulations, or was it the size of the theater? It was some, some prohibitive reason. We couldn't have them on the stage in the, uh, in the West End version, which was a real shame, actually. That, mm. was, that was one thing I would have loved to be able to keep. Very final question. What would you like to see filmed in the future? Our next musical. Yeah. <laughs> Can you share what you're working on? We're, we're currently uh, looking at various ideas um, and haven't fixed on one, but I think we're on the scent. I'm not sure we can say more than that. This I don't think we can right <laughs> now, but there will be a next one and it will be very good, especially the live capture. <laughs> I very much we're already we're it. already planning it. <laughs> so for folks at home, The Grinning Man is available to view on demand via Bristol Old Vic at home, and the link will be in the show notes. And where can we find you both online? Uh, we're both on Twitter, and that's about the only <laughs> that's about the extent of my online activity. Mark, same same. And I'll include your handles in the show notes as well, so people can follow you and find you there great thank you thank you great thank you both so much for your time today it's been a lot of fun chatting yeah thank you louisa film live musicals is a labor of love and we'd like to thank everyone who makes it possible thank you to our patrons josh brandon mercedes esteban rachel esteban david negrin jesse rabinowitz and brenda goodman al monaco david and Catherine rabinowitz and beck twist for your support if you'd like to support Film Live Musicals, please like and review on your podcast app. Find us on Twitter at Musicals on Screen and on Facebook at Film Live Musicals. If you'd like to support the site financially, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash musicals on screen. No matter what level you are able to pledge, you receive early access to written content and early access to this very podcast. Visit www.filmlivemusicals.com to learn more. Thanks for listening.